Hi, and welcome to episode 256 of Shane Plays Geek Talk. Thanks so much for pressing play. Uh, this episode's guest is comics artist and self-described art hobo Brian Shearer, who has worked on such uh, high-profile comics properties as Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Doctor Who, as well as his own creations, Gunship, Thunder Punch, and William the Last. Uh, we talk about all of that, uh, plus you know how he got into art and became a professional artist, and Tips for creators to build an audience online. What's the line you have to cross on a late crowdfunding project fulfillment before Shane gets annoyed? Shane being me, of course. Working on G.I. Joe pages while your wife is in the delivery room. SDCC and many other big cons aren't for comics creators and fans anymore. Transformers Toy History and Bob Budiansky, I think I'm saying the Budiansky, and Jim Shooter's vital contributions to Transformers lore. Some classic Doctor Who and New Who discussion. Favorite entertainment properties from the 80s. Shane was not down with the Ghostbusters cartoon that had an ape. Just want to reiterate that. It messed with my head. You'll hear more during the episode. 80s anime and those sweet, sweet Star Blazers twisty laser cannons. Catching episodes of Dragon Ball and Ranma 1 half in Japanese and trying to make sense of it. What's that certain unique something that Cowboy Bebop has? Last but not least, favorite breakfast cereals, cereal toys of yore, and Saturday morning cartoons. That and a whole lot more, with more discussion on Brian's art and being an artist in general, on this episode of Shane Plays Geek Talk. With no further ado, away we go. Shall, shall, shall we play a game? Why, yes, I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> getting geeky all up in your podcasts it's shane plays geek talk a journey into the things we love i'm your host shane Sachs. thanks so much for joining i and as i like to always say at the beginning of the show for first time listeners even though it's called shane plays geek talk and my you know i'm shane plays in various social media uh it's not always about games it's not always about playing games the, the plays is when i play when i do the geeky stuff that i think is fun uh and and as longtime listeners will know, comic books and comic artists are one of the pillars of the things that I like to talk about in my geekdom. And uh, my guest today is uh, he he hits two sweet spots at the same time in a very strong way. One is comic books. He's a comic artist. Uh, he does art beyond just comics, but he's done some pro comics work. But he also does some of the best Transformers artwork I've ever seen. Uh, and it, it, it's just, it's really good. So hopefully we'll talk a little bit today about comics art and also, uh, transformers again, two, two of my favorite things to talk about, but with no further ado, welcome to the show, Brian Shearer. Brian, how are you? Just trying to keep my head above water and, and all that. You know how it is being, being an adult. Yeah. Being an adult, doing that darn adult thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially being an artist, the, not, not just, uh, going and setting into a nine to five cubicle, but trying to do your own thing, man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, we may literally uh, be underwater here in a little bit here in Little Rock. We've got some pretty strong storm warnings. Yeah. So as, as we talked about before we uh, started recording, <laughs> hopefully we'll make it all the way through we'll, this. We'll make without, it. We'll make it. <laughs> yeah. Without, without craziness. So, but anyway, I wanted to also give a shout out to a mutual friend, Zippy the unicorn. That's right. Oh, ladies Zippy. and gentlemen, Zippy the unicorn. Um, who I met through Doug Tin Maple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then and then Zippy, quite a while ago, was like, hey, you should check out this Brian Shearer guy. So I started checking you out. And then, you know, I've just kind of kept up with you since then. Uh, but I want to, yeah, the, you know, I, I don't know many unicorns, I have to admit. Right. Well, they're pretty rare. Yeah. They, they are. But but Zippy is a unicorn among unicorns. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so thanks for the tip there, Zippy, and, and I hope things are, are fun in unicorn land. So, And, you know, I haven't kept up with there for a while. In fact, a couple of times I jumped on Doug Tin Naples' YouTube show, and we had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Last I saw with Doug Tin Naples, he's going kind of crazy with NFTs right now and doing pretty well. Yeah, so, he's yeah. Uh, he's making a killing over there in that NFT world. Yeah. And if you, if, if you know Doug well at all, the fact that he is – making a, uh, a lot of money at a very technical thing is mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm not getting into, there's, there's a whole different discussion. Some people are very concerned about FT, FT, F, 
NFTs, not FTPs, yeah. NFTs. Other people are very excited about them. Oh, I'm not yeah. going to go into that on this show. All I'm going to say is that, uh, you know, Doug's a very interesting guy. And he, uh, you know, he, of course, Earthworm Jim, the video game and, and graphic novels. And, and he's done other stuff. I think The Neverhood, uh, some other stuff beyond that. Uh, but he's worked very hard to Teflon himself so that he can't oh, be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and NFTs is where he's currently at. So, um, so yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll get a chance to talk, catch up with him and talk about all that. But uh, so, so anyway, we're not here to talk about Doug Tim Naple. We're here to yeah, talk about that guy. Why. Yeah, forget that Doug Tim Naple guy. Any, <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about Brian Shear. So, Brian, I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while just for the okay. fun of it. I'm going to have. The Shane Plays patented, the official patent pending Shane Plays Geek Talk icebreaker question. So here's okay. your icebreaker question. All right, Brian, what is your favorite breakfast cereal? Oh, man. Uh, that's a good one. Um, probably, are we talking like all time, like including young Brian? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we were talking about this on uh, with my, my chat on my YouTube channel today, actually, which was bizarre um oh how funny i did, yeah. I did total coincidence <laughs> um i really liked um lucky charms but you know just because of the marshmallows and um either that we were we had a lot of fruity pebbles in in the house growing up so probably one of those two but i haven't had them since i was a kid and yeah. so i don't know a bright and now if i had them they may be disgusting i don't know but N nostalgia is okay i yeah. mean you know nostalgia is a powerful drug uh, every now and then I'll dip my toe back into those waters, uh -huh. those milks, I guess. Yeah. And they're not as good. Your taste buds literally change, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. and your taste change. Uh, so like I ate that stuff now and I'm like, Oh, that's too sugary. Yeah. Um, that's probably what I would be. But when I was a kid, dude, that was, I mean, and you know what? I, I, I feel bad for kids today. Because, yeah, like they buy cereal or they get Cracker Jacks or whatever, and it'll have a digital code to go do something. Oh, that's lame. And, and I mean, yeah, yeah, I guess for kids today, but. Yeah, but pulling, there's something about digging your hand in the right, bottom of that bag. <laughs> and pulling out that little shrink wrapped or, uh, yeah. or plastic wrapped toy was, that was big, man. I mean, yeah. that was huge. So I, you know, uh, every generation has ups and downs, but we definitely had it made when it came to. Uh, breakfast cereals and the, yeah yeah we did the, we, well, we it was part of a whole experience it was like saturday yeah. morning cartoons yeah uh, yes, find the, toy, the cereal i mean it was yes, and now sir. everything is just all the time you have access to everything so nothing special right yeah right yeah there was what you get is a pro and con because on the pro side it's like if i want to go watch whatever i can watch it whenever i want but when it's limited to you can only see it that two or three hours on Saturday morning, mm -hmm. it becomes a very special time. Yeah. It's just like, um, man, I, I love Christmas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I have never lost my love of Christmas in some ways it's grown, uh -huh. but I don't want Christmas to be every day. No, no. Right. That, that yeah. Would be, yeah. Yeah. It would. Yeah. So anyway, and it's creeping we, in though. It's creeping it into like uh, to October. And yeah. September. It's like, stop it. Everybody. Yeah. September 15th. You start seeing the stuff. Go up. That, <laughs> yeah. That's because there's a lot of money to be made out of it. Right. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, th I think Halloween is total tangent, but I think Halloween is the second biggest probably uh, yeah. revenue generating uh, holiday or, or whatever. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it's now that we've waxed philosophical, um, I'm trying to remember what my favorite toy was that I ever pulled out of a. I'm sure I could go on some yeah. website. In fact, yeah. I'm going to do that. I'm I think that. mine was probably a, a paratrooper. Like you remember those old little figures, and and it would it would be like just a string with a. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure I pulled one of those at one time. That might have been it, the best. And it get in the string would get tangled up two yeah. thirds of the time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It up but, the oh, yeah. But it was still awesome. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Classic breakfast cereal toys. Hold on. I there was man, I'm trying to remember. There was a lot that I loved. Uh there was one, I don't even remember which breakfast cereal it was in, but it was a glow in the dark globe of the moon. Oh well, now wait a minute. That might sound familiar to me. And I was all about oh. that one, man. Uh that one stands out to me. There was also one you got like little skeletons out. Uh, there was like a little mm -hmm. glow in the dark skeleton. Yeah. Uh, um, there was also uh, the wall walkers that the, you, the, yeah, right. And then they would get all dusty and nasty and you'd still try to make them work. 
Yeah, I'm on the I'm on a website right now. I'll, I'll try to remember to add it to the show notes. Folks, you can always go to the show notes at shaneplays.com uh, for this episode and see the links related to the to the guest and other stuff we talk about. But yeah, right now I'm looking at the glow in the dark wacky wall walker. Oh yeah, that's the yeah. Stuff. Came in 1986, Fruit Loops and Corn Pops. Um, oh man, these are great. Yeah, there's. Uh, I'm trying to look for some that are the micro mini binoculars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here's the here's the uh, the uh, paratrooper. I'm seeing the paratrooper right now. Uh, so much. Oh, here they are, Captain Crunch Fun Globes. Yeah, you could get either a. Uh, they had an Earth and the glow in the dark moon globe. That was 1980. Wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that thing fascinated me. Uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah. And here's the spooky pirate skeleton. I remember that. There's so much cool stuff you could get in this era. And your mom would be like, "You got to eat all your cereal till you get to the toy." And we're like, yeah. "Okay, mom." And then first thing you did, man. And you're like, ah, I got it like a day yeah. ago. Yep. Well, and you know, it's good marketing because let's be honest, you're with mom, you're at the, you're at the grocery store. Mom goes down the, the, uh, cereal aisle with a sense of dread, knowing what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. You start yelling for cereals and nine times out of 10, it wasn't because you wanted to eat that cereal. It's because you wanted that little uh, surprise. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got to so you you like the wall walkers and I've got to go with the glow in the dark uh, globe of the moon. So that thing has stuck with me all these years. Uh, but yeah, Fruity Pebbles is a, is a is a is an ongoing one, and they used to have the fun commercials with Fred and Barney, and okay. and Barney was always trying to steal Fred's yeah Fruity yeah. Pebbles yeah yeah. And now kids don't know who the Flintstones are. Yeah, they they're like oh yeah, that's like a vitamin. <laughs> yeah, you mean the vitamins? Oh, kid. Yeah. <laughs> it's a vitamin yeah so anyway all right moving on let's uh so that was the icebreaker question which led into an official patent pending unnecessary but fun tangent um uh, now i consider you a comic artist what mm-hmm. do you consider yourself um at this point i don't know anymore um uh i mean i i, I spent 10 years in comics um i still make um uh, from time to time i'll still do something for like gi joe or um but more of a uh, i guess artist storyteller because uh, i mean i'm still doing my own books uh but I also do like youtube videos and and you know whatever pops up and I- i'm like a i'm like an art hobo <laughs> that, that, uh, i'll say that you're an art hobo okay i'll take that well now you also list i think in your twitter summary the whatever mm-hmm. it is i think it, you mentioned writer uh writer am i am i thinking the wrong part? i was thinking maybe did you write gunship thunder oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah 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 yeah. sorry yes um i did uh william last and gunship are mine i'm writing um uh when it comes to like you know licensed stuff like gho and transformers doctor who it was just art art chores so um but yeah that's one thing that that um uh like crowdfunding lets me do is you know do my do everything on a book which means it's slower <laughs> but right uh so that's what i'm that's what i'm doing now i'm trying to wrap up book two of gunship thunder punch i'm actually working on that while we're chatting and, oh cool uh, so okay so i gotta back up yeah you just mentioned something i didn't even know about you you've drawn for doctor who well it was the first uh professional thing i got with idw and this was like gosh 10 11 years ago was a Doctor Who miniseries, and that's kind of how I broke in at IDW. Um, so I did that, and then immediately got, uh, well, about six months later, started working on Transformers, doing inks, and then fell into the G.I. Joe world, and then I stayed there for, gosh, 10 years or so. Yeah. So was that the only, and I'm, I'm asking because I love, I love Transformers. Mm-hmm. I'm also a pretty big G.I. Joe fan, but I've got to go Transformers over G.I. Joe. Uh, but I'm also a, a pretty huge Doctor Who nut. So uh-huh. w- was that the only Doctor Who work you did? Yeah, um, I did do some inks on a, another miniseries before that. But that one was the one where I penciled and inked. And then um, I must say not long after that, Doctor Who moved to a different company. I moved to Titan in the UK. Mm. So um, I didn't I, I didn't get any more uh, Doctor Who work. And then 
uh, once I fell into the Transformers GI Joe world, you kind of get pigeonholed. Yeah. So uh, they're like, oh, he can do that really well. We'll put him on that automatic pilot and then right. forget about him. So um, what do you remember which uh, doctor it was that you did? That oh, with? yeah, it was uh, Matt Smith. OK, he's a fun. I bet you he'd be fun to draw because he's. All yeah, like, yeah, he's got. Uh, he's manic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, are you a Doctor Who fan or did you just have. Um, I am. Um, I, I kind of came to it late because when I was a kid, the intro freaked me out. And oh. that was that was like the intro, like the Tom Baker, yeah, I know Earth Wee, yeah, about. PBS, and the, the, the yeah. music seemed eerie, so I never watched it. And then when Eccleston came back, uh, my wife and I, it was actually probably around ten years, we we liked it, and we watched from Eccleston up until this first season of um, oh, who was after Matt Smith? Uh, oh, uh, uh, I can't. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but yeah, he. Uh, Peter Capaldi. Capaldi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of when we, me and my wife both just kind of lost interest. Um, I don't know. I, did, I wasn't, I didn't hate Capaldi. He just wasn't my favorite. And it felt like he just, I, I wasn't, he wasn't getting, they didn't quite know how to write him at first. Right. No, the tragedy of Capaldi as Doctor Who is, uh, he's actually like a rabid Doctor Who fan. So it was like, it was like a fantasy job for him. Yeah. Uh, but they he had three seasons and he didn't have a good season until his last season but then that yeah. one was was amazing uh because they got away from all the previous companions and storyline and gave him his own stuff mm -hmm. uh i actually like an old crotchety doctor I, like john pertwee is probably my favorite yeah uh of the classic although i love every doctor there's you know mm -hmm. i'm i work i'm working my way through all the classic doctors and i watch all the uh, like when they do an animated version because they've lost the episodes, but they have the audio. Like I'll, I'm, I'm pretty rabid about that stuff. Um, but yeah, Capaldi. I don't know if he got quote unquote done wrong because I don't know what happened behind the scenes. Right. But once they finally gave him his own companions and his own mm -hmm. storyline, so good. Yeah. Um, so if you ever revisit Capaldi, I would I would uh, recommend checking out his final season mm -hmm. uh and then also he did a tv movie you know how they do those specials yeah uh, he had what was just him with no companions and it, in my opinion it was one of the best pieces of tv i've ever seen regardless okay. of doctor and and i've heard other people really rave about it too uh he's like stuck in an old castle over and over and over and over and it's just this amazing uh -huh. story and piece of tv but anyway uh, you know, I'm up through, I think I'm on season two of Jody Whitaker. Okay. And I really, I feel bad because, I, you know, they had a whole different showrunner and a whole different change up in who was making Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that they just haven't made real great Doctor Who. And yeah. uh, in fact, that showrunner is leaving and, and a previous showrunner is coming back. But I feel bad because... You know, some people are going to say, oh, it's because they had a female Doctor Who. Now, there's canon reasons why I think it's weird that they had a female Doctor Who, but that's nerd stuff. I'm just talking yeah. about making good TV. I, I think she was fine. Uh, but, you know, I so I think they'll blame it on, oh, it was a female Doctor, when really I don't think the people show running and, and producing the show were that good, in my yeah. opinion. So, yeah. uh, but it's not terrible. You know, it, it has good moments, but overall it just doesn't feel like Doctor Who. I right. Don't know how to, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. see, but yeah, uh, you know, but Jodie Whittaker as the doctor, I actually kind of like her again. I have to separate. I've got nerd issues with them suddenly gender bending uh -huh. because it's been established before that that's not how it was, but yeah. that's, that's nerd stuff, right? Yeah. J just from making good TV. Uh, I actually like what they did with it because they didn't try to sex her up. Right. Yeah. She just, she was just kind of a goofy zany doctor. And so I didn't have any problems with that. Yeah. Um, I'll get back and watch Capaldi at some time. It's just yeah, you know, another yeah. thing to do. Uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I was um, I was at a convention a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, Sylvester McCoy was one of the guests. And it was I a, love Sylvester McCoy. Yeah. Um, the funny thing is, I didn't recognize him at first. Every so every time I saw him, I saw him like yeah. in the hotel lobby around breakfast time, like every day, and he was always alone. <laughs> like there was no one ever with him. Wow. And at first, yeah, he's older. I hadn't seen him in a while. I didn't recognize, I kind of, I knew that he was familiar, but I didn't recognize him. And like, we made eye contact 
and I thought he was like a comic book artist or something. And I'm thinking, and he got that look like, oh no, this guy's going to talk to me. And I was just trying to figure out where I knew him from. And then I just got my coffee and moved on. And then, um, then I was like, oh, that was Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. I would have to, I would have to restrain myself because they're people. They don't (laughs) always want to be in it. But I'd, I'd be like, dude, if would you like some company? Can I buy you some breakfast? I. So a lot of people don't like Sylvester McCoy because, as the Doctor, because that's when Doctor Who declined in its first, you know, it'd been on since the sixties and at the end of the eighties, it kind of ran out of steam and he was the doctor at the time. But a lot of us is because the BBC wasn't really putting budget into it and they were just kind of letting it, letting it wither. Uh, But he was the doctor on PBS when I started getting into Doctor Who. Okay. Yeah. And, and so I have a special place in my heart. And plus I like Sylvester McCoy. I liked him in the Hobbit movies. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that would have been fantastic to uh, to try to just chat with him. Um, anyway, all right. So getting off Doctor Who, but that that's really cool that, that that's how you broke in. So you've worked on GI Joe Transformers. Now I'm familiar with Gunship Thunder Punch, which is sort of a mecha type uh, comic book graphic novel. What was the other property you mentioned that you do? Uh, William the Last. William the Last. All right, let me move yeah. over to that. Yeah, that's a, uh, it's like an all ages fantasy um, uh, book. I started just kind of on a whim a long time ago, and I've just kind of been hacking away at it. And I put it up on a webtoon, and it kind of took off. I think I have like 24,000 subs on there, but it's like uh, I, I've been on a bit of a hiatus just because I've, I've been doing other stuff. And um, Antarctic Press picked it up. And published them as like I broke it had to break it up in like mini series and I've got two more issues if they're I'm like I'm late with it again because it's like I got I gotta I gotta make some money you know right. so Thunder you. Punch was was the money thing at the moment so um but yeah so that, that's one of those things that just kind of made for me and then other people enjoyed it so that's cool uh so it's it's on what what where is it at uh you can go to williamthelast.com it'll take you straight to the uh the webtoon. So is his arch nemesis Bill the First? <laughs> uh, no, no, but maybe it will be now. <laughs> Billy the First. Billy the Billy the First. Yeah, versus William the Last. So, uh, all right. So William the Last, uh, and then uh, Gunship Thunder Punch, uh, which it sounds like you're about to do another crowdfunding for the second volume. Is that correct? Uh, well? I've already done it. It's in You've demand now. Okay. I'm about to all wrap right. up the book and get it off to the printer, um, and then there'll be one more in this story arc that uh and i'm and i have i kind of learned my lesson because i'm a few months late um i'm gonna wait until i finish the book and then crowdfund the last one yeah you know there's a lot of discussion i'm if if something's a few months late on crowdfunding i personally am like that's fine if something goes years and years yeah that's uh, that's a little different <laughs> that's when i get a little crazy like I, i'm not going to mention the creator but i got a notification today that there's a, a comic creator you know, who used to work for like DC and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, had him on the show. Uh, I liked them personally, but I'm not going to support this crowdfunding because they're all they ever do is send out updates on why their existing projects that have already funded are late. And yet okay. here they are. And I'm like, I can't, you know, you got to deliver at some point, especially yeah. if you're about to turn around and, and launch another one. So yeah. I just, that, that feels that's weird. Thing to I me. can't, I have a hard time. Cause I know people that have started another project before fulfilling the other one. And uh, it, like, I would just take the hit and, you know, right. finish the book first. Well, cause um, your reputation is, you know, like, I mean, and I don't know where that guy's coming from. Maybe he's got medical bills and he's desperate for the Kickstarter money. So if yeah. he, if he said, Hey, look, here's the deal. My wife is, and I'm just speculating here, right, man. I'm right. just, I'm just spitballing. My wife has this. We have medical bills. Uh, we're going to deliver this, but I'm going to go ahead and launch this Kickstarter because we're going to do this now, and we need fun. You know, I'd be like, all right, maybe. But to just, I, I think he's about two Kickstarters late, and he's already launching another one, and that just that's, feels odd to me. So yeah, that that's yeah. a little. I don't yeah. know. I, I, I don't. Again, I don't know people's circumstances and stuff, but right. I, I'm stressed out enough just being as late as I am. And even right. though in, in crowdfunding terms, it's not that bad. Right. So that was, so you've got two volumes of Gunship Thunder Punch. Are they both still available on in demand? Or just uh, you can, five? you can catch up and get books one and two with the current, um, the current campaign. Are they in demand to Indiegogo or? Yeah, it's Indiegogo. Okay. I'll make sure to link that. And I'll, 
get those because I okay. missed out on your other two crowdfunding um, cool. campaigns. And so Gunship Thunder Punch, it, it's not Transformers. Your no. mechas have, just because you're so good at trans G1 Transformers style art, they're slightly reminiscent of that. But yeah. I want to be clear that you're not doing a Transformers rip. It's not the story is complete. Tell us a little bit about uh, Gunship Thunder Punch. Uh, so Gunship Thunder Punch is the story about uh, in the future, um, Earth is at war with Mars, um, and uh, this doctor, who's kind of the main character, her son gets kidnapped by Martians, and uh, the only person that can help her is the the an inmate who was the former commander of Gunship Thunder Punch who is, um, um, I don't know how much I want to give away, but he's, he's, he's basically a criminal, like a war criminal, sort of. Um, anyway, uh, he hid Thunder Punch in a, in a junkyard for 30 years. And um, so she and, has to get... Thunder him. Punch is a mecha? It, it is a it's, a, it's a sentient robot, but it's the only one. Oh, okay. And uh, they don't know why. So um, the, the commander is kind of resentful because he thinks it's just a freak of nature. Um, so they break that out. They go off to save her, her son, and then it gets worse from there. So, but it's a. What kind yeah. of personality does Thunder Punch have? He's more of a, like an angsty teenager, uh, yeah. and he, he's a little he's a little bitter because he's been sitting there for thirty years, just basically consuming um, media because he couldn't. Okay. He's just stuck there. So he's so in other words, he's bored and pissed off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A bored, pissed off teenager is it? Yeah. Very scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ticked off, maybe we'll say. Yeah. Uh, slightly nicer way of putting it. So he's bored and ticked off. Um, I'm looking at the art, man. Your your art is so good, dude. Oh, thank you. I you know, I I am I'm Transformers G1 all the way. Yeah. I you know, I don't hate the newer Transformers stuff. Some of it I like, some of it is not to my taste. Some of the IDW Transformer stuff is to my taste. Some tonight, uh, that's gonna, any franchise is going to be like that as it keeps mm -hmm. going, right? But the designs and the feel and the energy of G1 Transformers is where it's at for me. Yeah, and like even Thunder Punch, you know, I'm looking at uh, some of your artwork here again. It's not Transformers, but it captures that perfect Z guy. Zeitgeist is the wrong word. That that feel yeah, just it, yeah. it's perfect so and then you've got on uh, thunder punch too it looks like you have a synth wave album tell us a little bit about yeah the synth um wave album. so i mean I, I used to do a lot of music stuff and then this is i just I, i've been meaning to do a project and i was like no maybe i should just include an album with it and i'm working on it with a friend of mine um and so it's just like taking the book and making a soundtrack of maybe what you know based on certain scenes and ideas and stuff so, so it it's just like a little extra thing to include in there and yeah. But and an excuse to to make something I've been meaning to do anyway, right? So that that's kind of what that's about. So it says he transforms. What does he transform into? Um, he is a, a uh, he, yeah, he's a gunship. He's a, okay. um, a big a big gunship. And there were again there were uh, it, it's a uh, Earth forces kind of had this standard one, but he he's the only one that uh, transforms and is alive, so to speak. This looks so good, man. Um, yeah, I could just. Like I could tell, uh, I mean, I would read it, but I could tell I could just flip the art and, and just flip through the pages and just get off on the art because it's taken me right back to my sweet spot on the. Yeah, on the I mean, I was, a, I mean, again, I was a '80s kid and yeah, um, grew up with all that stuff. The, the, like you, that that's the the designs I like, um, and there there's some, well, not the Michael Bay designs, but some some of the other newerish designs. But the ones I find that I like are more based on that simpler G1 kind of thing. Right. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know, man. It just got into me and it's, it's lives in my head rent free, as they say. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just love that, that look, you know, and the, and I'm a Transformers fan. Uh, I, I don't like the designs that Michael Bay did there. I, I had a friend describe them one time as Baroque. And I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's a little <laughs> bit. Uh, they're just overly yeah, complicated or something. And in action scenes, you can barely tell who's who half yes, the time. And that is my biggest gripe. Uh, yeah, that I, it just there's no co really colors, and it, it's hard to keep track of things. It's a very right. poor character design, in my opinion. Yeah, there's there's definitely stuff I don't like. 
the the first Transformers movie, I actually it's it's a fun action movie. I, I don't have any beefs with it, uh, other than the fact that I would have taken the design stuff differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I mean, you know, turning Bumblebee into a Camaro is is a transgression of the deepest levels, but <laughs> marketing, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what What did you think of uh, the Bumblebee movie? I liked it a lot. Yeah, uh, I, I, I felt it struck a tone that I wish that the Michael Bay Transformer yeah. movies, you know, it, That's what it, I thought too. it had a lot more respect for the, you know, I mean, they even put in Cybertron scenes and they put mm-hmm. in uh, a cameo appearance of uh, the touch by Stan Bush and, uh-huh. you know, from the movie, and there was much more respect to the original yeah. stuff while also being its own thing. You know, I, I liked it a lot. Um, and I, I loved uh, stuff like, Michael Cena's character were like, you're going to trust these guys. They're, they're literally called Decepticons. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, just, it's like, you know, pointing out the, the ridiculousness of the naming, but it was a kid's yeah. thing. Right. You know I mean? Um, but again, I can watch Michael Bay's uh, movies and just put my brain in neutral and be entertained. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, the first two, especially uh, they get really whacked out as they right. keep going. As sequels um, do. Yeah, as the as they do, uh, but anyway, I yeah, I I as a Transformers fan, I felt that Bumblebee was much more respectful to the yeah, overall definitely. history of Transformers, and you know I'd love to see more of that. So let's go a little bit of your history is, uh, and you know from you said you're an '80s kid, same mm-hmm. here, you know. So I'm coming home after school, I'm watching Transformers, I'm watching GI Joe, I'm watching the real Ghostbusters. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm watching all this stuff that's getting into me, uh, you know, getting to getting to hang out rent free in my head the rest of my life. Um, right. So how did you go from being like, um, well, first, first of all, like, what are your favorite properties from back then? I'm guessing G.I. Joe and Transformers. Yeah, right? those were the two big ones. But I mean, like most kids, I would watch anything. Uh, right. like Voltron. And, and yeah. Thundercat. I even watched the other Ghostbusters. <laughs> The, the filmation one. Yeah, the, the, I couldn't do it because I was <laughs> such a huge trans. I was I, I was pretty uh, omnivorous when it comes to my uh, entertainment as a kid. I would watch just about anything, mm-hmm. but I was such a huge Ghostbusters fan. I yeah. mean, I was Ghostbusters. It's hard to, I mean, trans, G1 Transformers, huge, huge fandom for me and also Ghostbusters. So between the Ghostbusters movie and the real Ghostbusters TV show, which I loved a lot, yeah. When I I was like, I was like, uh, Ghostbusters, what, what, what is this? And Why I saw it like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw it in the in the TV guide, right? And I was like, yeah. what Ghostbusters? And I turned it on, and it was that. And it was like, it for all I know, it was a great show, but it was like expecting. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like your favorite breakfast cereal, and instead you you're eating you got, you got like fruit rings instead of fruit loops. Yeah, well, even worse than that, you got like a bowl of broccoli. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, grape nuts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what is this? So, and I, you know, I've learned more over the years. It was based on an old movie. That Ghostbusters came before our Ghostbusters, and this yeah. and that and the other. But at the time, it just seemed so odd. Yeah. Uh, that I think I watched like one of them and I was like, I I'm absolutely confused. Uh, <laughs> but then later I was like, Oh, that's calling this one, the real ghostbusters. Cause even my young adolescent, you know, uh, junior high and high school brain was like, Oh, there's some sort of legal thing you're having. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So yeah. And I loved Voltron, um, and you know, Robotech, uh, which is really Macross, and there's a whole yeah. thing to go there. So, are you uh, now back in the day? I mean, anime is a whole thing now. Back in the day, I just called it Japanese animation. I was right. like, "Oh, Battle of the Planets." Oh, well, half the time we didn't. I didn't even realize it was Japanese. Right? We're watching right. Voltron and um, like Transor Z, and uh, uh, a lot. I um, the first thing I remember was Star Blazers. Like, oh, really dude, watching. Star Blazers. So yeah, I just. I just did a rewatch not that long ago of the original season one of Star mm-hmm. Blazers, uh, before the Comet Empire comes into yeah. it, when it's just the Gamelons. It really holds up, man. Yeah, it's it's a good show. Um, it really holds up. Yeah, and it, they're great ship designs, too. I, oh, I fantastic. Love... There's a newer, like, 
Star Blazers 3000 or Space Battleship Yamato 3. Mm -hmm. There's a newer iteration of it, which I've heard is good that I have not seen. Uh, I did watch the live action. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was entertaining, but it was yeah. more like. I mean, it's basically like a live action season one. Right. Uh, with a little. Yeah. It just, I mean, it was good. Right. But yeah. I mean, give me the cartoon. Give me that. Yeah. Star Blazers was like a don't miss. I, yeah. mean, I was like, I'm not missing Star Blazers. Oh yeah, I remember. I remember going home after school. I mean, really young, and uh, so I could watch Star Blazers. I, I love that so much. I actually have a uh, I have a Yamato uh, model up on my. Oh, uh, sweet dude. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not the uh, one to three hundred scale with the moving turrets because yeah. that was like five hundred dollars. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. Even <laughs> fandom has limits when you have a kid. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. gotta support a family. Yeah. You can't, uh, can't justify that. How cool was that the first time you saw the uh, the gun turrets on Star Blazers blast out their energy? Oh, and the, then the lasers the twisted. Yeah. yeah. Oh, dude. It was so, so cool, man. Yeah. I, was, I remember I was, a, yeah. and I was in a studio space with some friends, uh, some other artists, and we, uh, we would, we, there was a while where we'd watch that at lunch. And I remember one of the guys going, Why are we not investing tons of money into twisty laser technology? Right. It has no. to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it, it must happen. Yeah. Star Blazers was, and the first time they fired the wave motion, oh, yeah. was like, you know, I could still, that episode still messes with me because they were like, oh yeah, there's a little floating planetoid. Let's, and they were not expecting, Yeah, you know, it was so <laughs> it was way more yeah. powerful than they thought. Yeah. Such, such a great, such a great moment. Yeah. I was a huge Star Blazers fan. I need to, or Space Battleship Yamato. I need to uh, watch the Common Empire season again because mm. I haven't. It's pretty good. It's. I mean, I saw it probably. Oh, it's probably been fifteen years, but I remember yeah. at the time it was. It was good. It's the third season when they got different voice actors that it falls apart. Oh, I never saw that far. I remember when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, because you were just at the mercy of whatever was on sure. your yeah. channel. I watched the first two seasons, and I was just all about it. Uh, oh, apparently back then they didn't. They had no record of who voiced anything, and oh. so when they came back with the third season, they didn't know who to call. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so different now. You know, yeah. I mean, it's there. They were, you know, it, anyway. Uh, yeah, huge Star Blazers fan. Pretty big Robotech fan, although it, I, I watched like several epi episodes of Robotech when I was like 13. And then I, I got on something. So I never finished the first season of Robotech until recently. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then uh, I finally got to see Rick Hunter hook up with Lisa Hayes after right. all these years, uh, which, of course, you know, the people who are really in anime is like Robotech is really Matt Cross and yeah, took yeah. three different shows and mushed. All I know is I enjoyed watching it. That's yeah. All I can tell yeah. It. So it's like Transor uh, Z and Mazinger Z. Right. It was. So what's the story there? Well, that's a uh, that was like a very, very mid 70s, early 70s yeah. show. And when it came over here in the 80s, they basically took two shows and smashed them together. Yeah, very uh, and they took out a bunch of things that were a little more graphic, I guess. For for very common, yeah, yeah. yeah. What what was acceptable for Japanese youth in Japan yes. culture time was not acceptable Definitely for not. our youth. Yeah, and some of the um, like when you watch Voltron, mm -hmm. I think it's Voltron. Uh, they'll they have all the like in in the dub and and the rescripting of it for American audiences. They have all these throwaway dialogue like oh those are just robot controlled ships yeah like yeah. when the ship blows up or uh like when they mow down the enemy and there's like mm -hmm. blood all over the ground those oh no those were robot soldiers you know yeah um and if somebody like there was one instance where somebody died uh and they even go to their grave but they're like oh no they went to an alternate universe like they just would not <laughs> they came up with this really convoluted way of explaining the character's absence yeah it, yeah like, to a new dimension well that's like so they, in star blazers the doctor uh they always said he was drinking spring water oh yeah he was drunk you yeah. know he was a total alcoholic oh yeah well there was there's a in star blazers there's a uh there's a scene where the captain tells there's like hey we're gonna have a drink before we launch on our mission uh -huh. and, and he says all of you have been handed water <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sure, they yeah. toast. Yeah, they toast their uh with water. Yeah. yeah. Uh and then of course there's uh Battle of the Planets which is uh famous or infamous for the complete I mean they took they rescripted it completely for 
American audiences, like the storyline that unfolds is almost completely different from what the, it was like Gotcha Mon or something in it. And uh, like the, I don't know if you remember Nine's Arc Nine and is it Nine's Arc Nine or the little, there was a kind of an R2D2 type robot and a little robot dog mm-hmm. that Battle of the Planets every now and then would switch to them and they would comment on the action and they would like send messages to the g-force team Mm -hmm. they weren't in the japanese version anywhere total (laughs) but as a kid it it was like it worked i didn't you know it all seemed now that i watch it with an adult i'm like yeah these characters never actually interact yeah 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 but uh and the fiery the phoenix and the fiery phoenix man i do ah. I do. I could. We could do a whole episode on that. Let's get back to your stuff. I want people to know about what you do. So, at what point did the love of all that? Oh, well, actually, let me do this. Do you have any anime you'd like to recommend to people? I just watched. I've never watched uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion or Evangelion the series, mm-hmm. but I just watched the four rebuild movies okay. where they retell the series, and the animation was spectacular. Uh, the plot at time gets quite mind boggling. You might be interested because I know we're, we're both brothers in the faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of, now, of course it's goofy theology, right? But there's a lot of, uh, Christian theology and other stuff kind of mixed in with it. That, okay. that is kind of an overriding theme, but do you have any anime from your youth that you've watched recently that you'd like to recommend? Uh, no, I mean, as far as, you know, straight up anime goes, it's, it's something that, um, other than like watching Cowboy Bebop, um, which I which I loved, um, I really there's not a whole lot that just, it was always very intimidating where to jump on, right? right? So other than just stuff I happened to stumble across as a kid, like we just talked about, um, with the exception of like things that would like you know movies like Spirited Away or something like that. Oh, that yeah. See, I don't even consider that anime. That's yeah. like a class of its own. That is yeah. Like- yeah, that's an art form of its own. It's Miyazaki, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, it is anime, but it's, it's technically, but a different, yeah, different kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a man, so beautiful, his stuff. So I was going to, I had a, I had an anecdote I was going to relate that you might, uh, a humorous anecdote, if you will, mm-hmm. Brian. Sure. Uh, that I was going to relate. Uh, so I lived in Japan in the early 90s. I was in the Air Force. Okay. And, at the time, you know, like I just thought of this stuff as like, you know, Japanese. All I'd ever seen was like, you know, some TV shows and I'd seen like parts of Galaxy Express and this and that. But I mm-hmm. thought of it as, you know, like Japanese animation. Uh, and then I was in Japan and I could I could get local TV channels. Uh, so I would flip through and I, I stumbled on Dragon Ball. Uh huh. So imagine watching little slips here and there of Dragon Ball in Japanese, not having a clue what they're saying and trying to make sense of it. Uh, but it, but the the art style was so absolutely riveting that I would watch it, and I remember thinking, uh, because you know the anime is is kind of people say big eyes, small mouth, yeah. right? Uh, that was the first time I'd seen anime that what they had like rectangular eyes and not big, okay. you know, and so that struck me. And then there was another anime called Ronmo one half. I remember that. Okay. So do you remember <laughs> that if they fell into water, they would change into animals? Uh, I know. I just remember the one that would turn into a girl. Right. So there was a girl turned to a, I think. A oh, bear. wait, wait, didn't one turn into a panda? Yeah. There's like a panda. Yeah. Like, yeah here's yeah. the thing. I would, I would sit there and watch that. I watched multiple episodes. And it took me three or four episodes to realize that they were changing form because I'm watching it, not in English, you know, but I was just, I was still into it, you know? Um, So that, that was interesting, you know, and, and, and I feel bad because I talked to people who are big into anime and and they would probably kill to have lived in the, in Japan in the early nineties and watch that stuff, you know, and I'm just like casual, like, yeah, it was kind of neat. And the other thing is Cowboy Bebop. I was mm-hmm. just talking to somebody, I think yesterday or recently about Cowboy Bebop. No, it was yesterday. I, w- it helped me understand, and I'm not down on Cowboy Bebop, but I watched an episode of it a long time ago, and I just, it just didn't grab me. What is so many people are into Cowboy Bebop? What is the appeal to you? Um, it's a bunch of things. Um, in order to, to really get at you, because throughout the whole series, everything builds on. Like, you can't just hop in and out. Um, 
but it, it's the perfect blend of just mood and music and uh, and the characters are really good uh, and it's a very slow build up towards the end um it, it's kind of hard to you know hard to, to describe exactly why it just caught my attention but uh um because I, I mean i remember seeing it at one point and i don't remember why I, or me and my wife watched it my wife really liked it she i mean she's not like against like like she'll, she'll if she finds something good in the anime she'll watch it but it's very very rare right Mm-hmm. Uh, she really enjoyed the story too. Um, so it's, I think it's just, I like the, the 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 feel of it, the story, the animation, the voices. It was just kind of a whole package for me. Um, you're you're the second person in a row. The person I was talking with yesterday also mentioned the music. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. it's like the you know the fight scenes, and it's like jazz type music, right. and then it goes to blues and stuff. It's like a it's like blue collar space, right? Is what it is. Okay. Um, it, it's like it it um. The, they're bounty hunters and they're just basically struggling to get by, but everything is very kind of almost old West, but in space. Right. All right. Well, I'll give it another shot. Now, did you try out the live action series that was on Netflix? I've, I, yeah, I've watched like three or four episodes. And again, it's just a rehash of the, the cartoon and some things don't translate well from that. It's like, you wouldn't really understand it if you hadn't seen the cartoon. Gotcha. And the but the, and they use a lot of the same exact music, so it's just like it, you know what it feels like. It feels like Cowboy Bebop cosplay. Oh, that's what that's what it feels like. To All me. right, well, that, that's an interesting way. But yeah, I'll check out Cowboy Bebop. I think I added it on Tubi, um, if I remember right, because people just keep raving about it. And yeah. when when over, I mean, they've been raving about it for decades now, so it wasn't a fad. I mean, yeah. people are really into Cowboy Bebop. So yeah, it's kind All of right. a standard at this point. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to this. So how did you go from loving this stuff to getting into art? Um, well, I mean, I always, you know, drew and loved drawing and art and, and all that. Um, and then after I got out of college, I mean, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, just, you know, I got married a week after I graduated college and got a job a few months later. And, um, uh, at some point, I was like, you know, if I'm, I'm if I'm ever going to, you know, I was a guy that at school or, you know, at work, I was always just doodling. And I'm like, maybe I should actually try to do this, get good at this and do this for a living. Um, so, I mean, I, I was working on, you know, I did a few little, like indie books with a friend and um, just had to get a lot because I didn't really settle down and focus on getting better intentionally at art until around college, maybe a little after. Um, and like putting the work in, I was always just more just, I'm going to draw this. Oh, that didn't work. I'll just draw this. Um, Mm -hmm. so, uh, then, um, there was like, I mentioned the studio, there was some, you know, for some reason around here where I live, there's a lot of comic artists and who'd worked for DC and Marvel and they had a studio and I'd meet up with them at Heroes Con in Charlotte, um, pretty regularly. And, and uh, they kept saying, Hey, come up to the studio and, you know, hang out and now, stuff. Do you and, feel like giving a shout out to them by name or? Oh yeah. So it was, uh, it was Tsunami Studios. It's not kind of, it's kind of defunct at this point, but it was Randy Green, uh, Rick Ketchum, who's passed away. Um, John Wyckoff, Kelly Yates, um, uh, Robert Atkins, um, Steve Bird. I'm going to forget somebody. They're going to be mad at me. Uh, uh, so, but so all those guys were working, you know, back then and, um, Rick, especially, who was a, a, a inker for, for Marvel for years. Yeah. Um, I went to the studio and I'd start working here and there. And and then eventually I just got moved into the studio and became a part of it. And I spent about five years or in that environment. And that I didn't realize it, you know, when I was there. But that was kind of like art college for me because mm-hmm. uh, it was like you're just around that all the time. You're seeing. Well, the- let me also interject. You got to yeah. see the business side. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't. I mean, there's a business to being an artist or a writer or a creator. So yeah. what a wonderful opportunity that there was a studio that you could can that. Wow. That's that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I got to see and Rick was especially good with this. He would, you know, OK, uh, I'd hear him talking to editors or he'd say, hey, when you write this email, you need to phrase it this way. Uh, so, I, I mean, I got to see a lot of the ins and outs of how people got work and once you got work. Uh, the the drama or the the people management skills <laughs> that it right. takes to deal with people, um, and so that was that was really good. And then, um, and then I you know moved after that kind of that dissolved a little bit. We we all just started, went home and started working at our homes. And then so and that's but but being in that environment and and being able to start out like I would ghost 
some pages just to help like Rick or somebody make deadlines. So okay, so let me ask you this: you're 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 not even really in the business yet. You're just kind of easing in. You're around these guys. So if you ghosted on something, uh, which basically means you assisted an artist without mm -hmm. credit, without credit, just to help somebody out, it happens more than people probably realize, especially when artists live or work together. Um, that's a common thing I hear. It's like, yeah, I would, I would help so-and-so finish their yeah. stuff. And and then if you saw that come out in a comic book, did that blow you away? Like I worked on that page or did you get any moments like that? Um, yeah. I mean, there was a few, few moments yeah. where, you know, early on you're like, oh man, there's my page. I want to see how my page turned out. Um, and then, and then once you do more pages, it just kind of like, it, it just comes a little more commonplace. Yeah. But, um, uh, usually after that point, it, it's, I, oh, I made a mistake here. I want to see what, if they left it in. <laughs> Oh. Um, so the, the one I like, the story I like to tell is that, um, I was ghosting on an X-Men page, inking some background stuff. And there was a, a scene in a, um, uh, a laboratory with a scientist and it. And the person's head was right in line with a series of rectangles design on the back wall. Yeah. And I was tired and it was late and I just gave them a blockhead <laughs> and, um, and I showed it to Rick and he goes, nah, leave it. See what the colors does. <laughs> And so when I got it, you could tell the colors got to that one. Uh, and he just kind of sort of put a little yeah. colored oval, but I'm like, what? nah. Do you, do you remember this issue by any chance? I would love to go look at it. Oh, this. I can find it. I don't know off the top uh, of my head. Uh, it would have been in like, you know, around 2008 or cool. nine or so. So but. you're, man, you're just hanging out and you're literally ghosting on X-Men pages. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. I, I don't think that. I mean, I, I imagine you appreciate that opportunity, but there's oh, a yeah, lot of definitely. people. Yeah, they're like, yeah, that's that's so good. Um, so, uh, so you at what point did you get that? Like your first, like it was your job, a professional job. You weren't just assisting somebody else, but it was you, you were hired to do a project based on your own merit. Um, I would probably have been Doctor Who, but. The only caveat with that is that a studio mate had started that miniseries and couldn't finish it. And I was inking him and then he, he couldn't finish it. And so I kind of took over. But so other than that, it would have probably been G.I. Joe um, because and I, I inked for years before I penciled it all for, for Joe. But um, for my inks, the, the pencil at the time, Shannon Gallant, he he liked my stuff and he, he kept. And so around issue 173, it was it was funny it was the the month that my son was born so i was in the delivery room inking joe pages mm. um and it, wow. it was it was one of those things where um the the penciler wanted me to ink him and i couldn't for there was some some things that came up and i couldn't but he kept persisting they kept asking and kept asking and finally i, I did it and then i was on the book for like 50 some issues I didn't realize that you had that long of a run on G.I. Joe. That's oh, fantastic. I'm pretty sure that me, Shannon Gallant, Jim Brown are the longest running creative team for Real American Hero because okay. we were on it forever. Okay. I got to come back and ask. I'm going to I'm gonna put two questions out there Okay. so I don't forget to ask them, but then I'm going to circle back and, and make a comment. So I want to know who your favorite uh, G.I. Joe and, and uh, Transformers characters are, both just as the character and then to draw because I know that okay. can be different. But you mentioned, so I want people, you know, people, they have these ideas of what it's like to be a writer or to be an artist or to be a, or, you know, I'm just going to go freelance, make websites. That's what I did for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the ideas of what it's going to be like. And sometimes you're controlling your own schedule or whatever, and things are going great. But there's times where you got to step up and get it done to keep food on the table. And I remember my wife was in the hospital. They were uh, trying to induce labor and all that. And I'm having to run down to the waiting room with a laptop and have business meetings. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's not always just this, you know, I, I mean, you, when you, when you're uh, chasing that kind of life, it can be incredibly rewarding, but there's so sometimes you, there's no backup. Yeah. Yeah. You got, you know, and you, and it's a business. It's not just pursuing a dream. There's a business there. Yeah. So, um, and I was, I remember I was taught whoever I was talking with, I can't remember everything it was, but I wasn't going out of my way to advertise the fact that 
but somehow it came up. I don't know if there was like they were hearing announcements in the background or something like that. And 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 they asked. It was like, yeah, I'm I'm at the hospital. You know, my wife's having a baby, and that like impressed them so much. You know, and I was like. <laughs> It's, you know, I'm like, I, I got to have money. <laughs> no, I'm having a kid. That's expensive. <laughs> yeah, I got to have money. So, all right, let's come back. So who are your favorite Transformers and G.I. Joe characters? And why is it that sniveling worm Starscream? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Actually, my favorite is Mirage because he was the first toy I had. Uh, okay. Mirage um, is cool. Yeah. Um, and then for Joe, my favorite was always Flint because he had a cool cool outfit and a shotgun very cool now are they your favorite to draw um no probably uh well I, I, again this this goes back to kind of like what you were just talking about what what's what's the fastest um it would probably be snake eyes and optimus prime because i don't have to look up reference prime uh is a great design but is it is it is he less detailed, like because he doesn't have a mouth and stuff? Or is no, it's just that I've drawn him so much. Oh, okay. I just, I just know him, and uh, and him and Megatron, and um, maybe Starscream, but the rest of them I always have to look up because there's all you know to get the yeah, if you're going for too. to get it just right, you're gonna mess something up because there's so many little pieces and parts. I'm like, what is it? Right. What does he have on him now? Right. Yeah. Some have guns on their arms. Some yeah. have little spiky stuff sticking out their shoulders and. You you recently did a series of Insecticon drawings. Mm -hmm. and they're they're especially goofy. They have little things yeah. poking off of them and this yeah. and that. I'm trying to think who would my favorite transform. I I love Starscream because he just entertains me. He's such a yeah. sniveling, like he's a slime ball, but he's an, a, a ridiculously entertaining slime yeah. ball. He's yeah. you know, and it's the same voice actor. So Cobra Commander is the same way. He's just always throwing yeah. a fit or being whiny. He's just funny. Which um, the same voice actor is also Wheeljack. I did not know that. Yeah, that's actually his real voice. Learn something new every day. So, uh, of course, I, I grew up loving Bumblebee, mm -hmm. right? Because he was uh, prominent in the cartoon, and also he was very prominent in the comic books, the Marvel comic books. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was a big a Bumblebee fan. I've always loved Jetfire or Skyfire, however you want to say yeah, it. Yeah, I like them too. I'm a ridiculously big Grimlock fan. Um, okay. And I love his personality in the cartoons, you know, the, the G1 yeah. cartoons, you know, he's just a big dumb lunk. Like when he's in the, he's in the Transformers movie and he just wants Cup to tell him more stories while they're in the middle of a fight and stuff yeah. like that. So, yeah. I always cheer when the, when the Dinobots show up, like there's a, there's a Transformers G1 cartoon where, um, the, uh, Megatron has come up with some scheme to get all the Autobots away from the arc. So the Constructicons are going to go in and, oh, yeah. Yeah, and destroy yeah. Teletran 1. And uh, I think it's the final season of the, or final episode of the first season, because they kind of ended it. Like they left it so that the story could be ended because all the Decepticons fell into lava. But oh, yeah. <laughs> so the, the Constructicons are about to take Teletran 1 out and Teletron's like, I don't think so. And he wakes up the Dinobots and the Dinobot and like the Constructicon, nobody knows about the Dinobots yet. I don't think. Uh, maybe they do, but anyway, the Dinobots come out and and start whooping the Constructicons' butts, and I just I love that so much. So anyway, that's a total. And then there's another great Grimlock moment where uh, it's in the third season where they've gone into the future, and uh, Trypticon gets drained of his energy and falls over on Grimlock, and you're like, well, Grimlock's dead. And then it's like uh, at the at, at the crucial moment, like Grimlock comes busting out of the ground to save the day, and it's just like, yeah, I love it. So anyway. Him Grimlock. So um, did you have any favorite characters from like the show, like the characterizations or anything? Um, I, let's see. I mean, I did like, you know, uh, Megatron. Um, yeah, Megatron's great. He's a uh, great villain. And Gal is. Galvatron has grown on me over the years. It took me a long time to get my head around. I went and saw the Transformers movie in 1985 at the yeah. theater. Yeah. It took me a long time to get around the status quo change. It took me years to get my, but now that I've got my head around it, I really like a lot of it. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, so you were saying you like Megatron. Yeah, I like Megatron. Um, I did like, um, I mean, I like Bumblebee. I remember drawing Bumblebee in a third grade talent show. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, those two, I liked Skyfire. Um, and I was always a little disappointed that Skyfire and uh, Jetfire were not the same toy. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there was it had something to do with Macross uh yeah. legal copyright yeah. stuff. I don't I mean it, it was the first 
Skyfire, Jetfire was basically a Veritech fighter for yes. Robotech. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So you know, I have that. Um, but it was like, yeah. I, and you just have to bend your imagination. And go, this is Skyfire, I guess. <laughs> when you're when you're a kid, and you're playing with them. He's like, oh well. Um, so you yeah. Still remember in the TV show in the first episode at the end, he's like one last blast, and then he. Crash. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. So. And it's very noble, and he dies, and they need him. Let's go def defrost yeah, him. I think they defrost him the very next episode. Yeah, yeah. but it's like, why did you, why did you wait so long? <laughs> <laughs> you are not yeah. good friends. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, um, I mean, there's. I mean, I love Omega Supreme. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love, I love uh, Skylinks because he's such an arrogant jerk. Oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you're like, what is he? He's like a I he's a thing. he's a I mean it was a shuttle but it's like what do you transform into a bird dinosaur some sort of something? like it's like a bird skeleton <laughs> yeah uh, but he's such an arrogant jerk but when the chips are down you know he'll get in there the I I don't know I like I like cup I like blur yeah um I, mean, I probably like every transformer on some level yeah yeah there, I can't think of any that I just absolutely hated from the original do you, uh, do you think it's about time for a uh, a we is it who was what was the little robot that lived in Optimus Prime's trailer roller right do you think it's time for a roller miniseries <laughs> um I would draw it <laughs> roller saves the day yeah I'm, I'm I'm totally up for that that yeah the you know that the animators and the writers hated dealing with that trailer and there were because it's like it was just there but every now and, you know they were like okay we need to sell more toys so show the trailer and show roller you know <laughs> yeah so it would show up you know so yep I yep know. yeah all right oh and who's my favorite gi joe I, it has to be cobra commander because he's such okay. a yeah. entertaining yeah. worm um on the joe side uh I don't know. I like Scarlet a lot. Okay. I like yeah. I like Snake Eyes because I grew up in the eighties with ninjas. Yeah, so well, how, how can yeah. you not how can you not like Snake Eyes? Yeah. I've um, always liked the Cobra Battle Android Trooper. Yeah, that's a great yeah, Cobra always had the cool looking stuff, right? The bad yeah. guys always have the cool stuff. Yeah. Um uh, I like the the figure, not necessarily the cartoon or whatever, but or the comics, but the figure I liked the best was um uh, it was the flamethrower guy who had like a oh, uh, blow torch. Yeah, I loved his. The yeah. first time I saw that figure, I just fell in love with it because it was so dynamic. Yeah, um, and it had the cool, you know, flamethrower and all that stuff. I like Destro. Destro is a great design, um, and I like the Arctic guy. Um, I can't remember his name. Snow job. Yeah, because the first G.I. Joe comic I read featured Snow Job. So okay. he kind of, yeah. And I think that was the first one where they introduced Destro. So, uh, and you know the trivia, I'm sure you know the trivia that, you know, they killed Optimus Prime in the movie, mm -hmm. right? And kids like freaked out and they were like, oh, we didn't realize that, you know, these are just toys. We were just trying to introduce new toys. And then they realized that kids like had really connected with these characters. Yeah. yeah. So in the G.I. Joe animated movie, they killed Duke. Yeah. But then they retconned it. They're like, oh, no, no, he's just in a coma. And yeah. now he's woke up. Right. Yeah. So he's fine, everybody. He's fine. Yeah. He's fine. And it's just supposedly some kid locked himself in the bathroom for two weeks because Optimus Prime oh. died. I've, I've, I've never been able to confirm that, but that's the that's the oh. urban legend. Oh, man. Uh, I, was, I was sitting there drawing um, at a New York Comic Con, drawing a commission of um, Soundwave, and I felt somebody leaning over me and watching me look up, and this guy goes, uh, I'm sorry, who who is that? I saw this is um, drawing Soundwave. He goes, oh, I, you think I remember that because I named him. And I'm like, I'm sorry, who are you? Holy crap. <laughs> yeah, it was Bob uh, Budinsky who named nearly every Transformer in a weekend. I'm glad That's you brought him up. That is such a fascinating story. Yeah, that dude, all of the, he named them, and those little vital stats. Yeah. Yeah. That you got like their strength is this and their energy is this and their special weapon is this. He worked for Marvel Comics. And I think Jim Shooter was like the guy who was working on this. We didn't like what he did or something. I can't yeah. remember what it was. So they said, hey, we can you do this over the weekend? And this Bob guy sat down over the weekend and just blasted out what is now like such an important part of the whole history of it all. Yeah. Um. 
And he doesn't get enough. He doesn't get enough respect for that. Yeah, yeah. And he's a super, super nice guy too. Um, we sat and chatted for a while, and he was like, he started telling me like, oh, you know, you know, back in the day, at Marvel, when you look at the robots, they all look kind of human. It's like that's because nobody wanted to draw robots. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it kind of makes sense. Looked. Yeah. Because if you drew them like they really transformed, they would look. Yeah. Really weird. So they um, just look like people wearing robot costumes. I yeah. Guess. Right. Which I like. I, that's that's the design sense that has gotten into me but yeah bob budiansky i think his name is yeah, yeah. Um, massively important blasted all that out in a weekend um and then jim shooter i'm pretty sure it was jim shooter doesn't get enough credit he came up with all the autobots decepticons uh they may have already been named autobots and decepticons but he came up with the whole cybertron and mm -hmm. the or between them and all of that lore. Yeah. Because they wanted to sell the toys. They were called something else in Japan. You know this. I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Uh, Microman uh, and. Um, oh my gosh. Something uh, damn low or damn uh, low. Or... It, I, yeah. I'll remember it in a minute. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. And they wanted to sell the toys here. But they needed the backstory. They needed the lore. Mm -hmm. So Marvel Comics came up with all that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think they get enough credit for that. Um, especially Jim Shooter and like yeah, so, uh, yeah. Diaclone. Don't judge. That remember. was it. Yeah, but that, and that oddly enough, it's like it, that explains the size difference because Microman was meant to come with a little man that fit in the vehicles, mm. and Diaclone was everything else like the gun and the tape recorder, and they were actually uh, that makes two completely sense. different yeah. lines. Yeah, and and of course the uh, reflector. Was it Reflector who became the working camera? Which yeah, one was the camera. Yeah, yeah that was, was three different. It was yep. three different. Uh, three different um, Decepticons that that transformed into mm -hmm. the camera, if I remember right. So, uh, all right. So let's let's talk a little bit about. Uh, well, let's get back to talking about. So, uh, you were working on your art. You got your first professional job as. Doctor Who, and then there was a guy on G.I. Joe who really wanted you to help on G.I. Joe, and then you ended up doing a, you said a 50-issue run? Uh, yeah. Yeah, just about that. So how much how much Transformers work did you do? Um, it was, oh gosh, it was quite a bit. I mean, I started on Real, uh, Robots in Disguise. I know I did four issues there. Actually, the first thing I ever did, again, was ghosting a uh, movie uh michael bay design and that was a nightmare uh um, yeah. they couldn't keep people on those books well it's, um, it's just too intricate I yeah mean, it's too it's much just, it was yeah. just it was just too much um so i did that and then i moved over to more than meets the eye and i did a lot like i was here and there between like issues 12 all the way up through like 50 or something but it wasn't consistent and they would pull me off of joe every once in a while like can you do this book and then they would shuffle me around like for a month or two and then i'd be back on joe uh, so I, I, I can't remember exactly the number of books, but it's a, it was a handful, but not, not as many as G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe was there, you know, and I guess the last thing I did was, well, they, they redid the, um, the silent issue, uh, the silent interlude. They, they got 22 artists to do one page. I did a page of that. Um, so that was the last thing I did. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's a, it, it becomes a blur after I, you know, turn around and all of a sudden it's been a decade and I'm like, wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's great, man. So, and I'll, I'm also looking, I want, I want to see if this is accurate or not. Cause wikis might, yeah, the transformers wiki um, has you also working on some Legion of superheroes in Dresden files. Is that correct? Oh, I did do Dre yeah, Dresden files. Um, I mean, I forgot about that. Uh, I inked uh, Dresden files with uh, Rick was working on that. That was one of the studio things that got passed around. Um, and then Legion of superheroes. I think I may have done helped out on some of that. That that's that that would have been early on. It would have been like kind of just a page or two, maybe. I can't even okay. remember now. All right, but I mean the 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 lion's share of your uh, work for a publisher is IDW. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what is you know what is it like working IDW? I've had a hard time getting my hand head around them because I don't. I, and maybe I, you're not there anymore, right? You don't really um, do maybe like once a year I'll do something with them. Okay. What what is the concept behind IDW? I mean, I know they do a lot of fran or license work, but then they do a lot of 
collections and publishing for like Marvel. And in some cases they're doing some of Marvel's books. So what, what is the deal with IDW? I don't quite get them. Uh, well, you know, I, they, they do a lot of licensing, right? So yeah. they got, and they have a handful of creator owned things, but that wasn't their main right. thrust of their, their business model. So their business model, from what I understand it, what, what had happened was all licensing stuff. Now, when the Marvel stuff comes in, like, a few years ago, Marvel contracted with them to hand off some titles for them to do, and then they're reprinting some Marvel. So there's some, like, here, handle this for us kind of thing, and I don't fully understand it. Um, because uh, then they'll do, like, artist edition or collected editions of, like, Right, and those are... Things. Everything I've seen on those, those are very well received by the art community when they do. The, yeah, they're the great. Edition. Yeah. And that's where, you, I mean, the artist edition, if I understand right, is they, they assemble as much as the original art as they yes. can so that you can see what it looked like before it gets like colored. And yeah. So you can see like the, 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 the white out and the, right. And all the, all the cool things the artists like to see, but you don't want to publish. Right. Yeah. You don't want it to make it out there. Um, what is that stuff that they used to use? I don't think they use it anymore because so much stuff's done by computer now. It was something called something tone where you would cut out. Oh, Zipatone. Zipatone. Yeah. 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 For the grays. That, yeah. That was a staple of the 80s. Yeah. Uh, Zipatone and Whiteout. And uh, yeah. there's a, that that's the stuff that I mean, I really like, I like looking at, you know, go to one of the yeah. few benefits for me now going to San Diego Comic Con is I just look for like art stuff, like real art. And I just want to see it up close and handle it. And, um, admire it and then I ignore right. like all the movie stuff yeah that's I mean so uh, yeah let me that's an issue and I'm not looking to be negative my my show is very super rarely negative even if I have negative opinions on something because I don't that's not what people are listening for they're just listening yeah. for an interesting conversation my perception of SDCC is like I have no desire to go yeah. because it seems like it's turned into just a big huge pop culture explosion mm -hmm. and comic books get more and more minimized. Now that, what, what is, okay. Is, it is true or is not true? You know, it is. Um, yeah. So the, the frustrating thing with, with San Diego and I, and I, you know, I've gone every year since like 2006 for the most part. Right. Um, and I did originally, I went to get work and I got, you know, for me, it ended up more being a little, a little FaceTime with the, the my editors. Right. So you're kind of right. staying there. So it, it was, it made sense at a certain point for me. But I did set up there as an artist in Artist Alley one year. And you really artists typically don't make any money in Artist Alley. Like people are just not there to buy comic art. Right. They're there for the they're there for the movie and TV show. They're for the yeah, the exclusives. Yeah. And the cosplay and, and the, the cosplay yeah. and and all that. So um then it became in later years just a, kind of a mini vacation for me. <laughs> Right. So I would get up, you know, I'd be up with Doug and we'd go have cigars and then we'd walk around and then I just hang out and I'd go see some, again, I go look for art. Like there's a, there's a booth there I always would go to that not a lot of people would be around. It's kind of tucked away, but it's like early 20th century magazine illustration, but the, the painting, the original paintings mm -hmm. and they're selling them for like $80,000, but like, like, it's like going to a museum, right? right. And you're just like flipping through this amazing stuff. So that's kind of what I go there for. Um, I'm not going to go this year just because, uh, well, it's like they just, I just got an email last week. They're that all of a sudden these emails start coming through. It's time to get your hotel. You have a professional badge. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's like, it's you know, look at my watch. It's like two months away or whatever. Um, so, and we're going on vacation, family vacation. So, uh, I'm, I may go back next year, but the interesting thing is like you, you, you compare that to New York comic con, which is probably the second biggest one. And artists make a ton of money there. That, that's a huge show. So it's much more focused on the. It, it is, but even though there are like um, there are movie things and pop, it's very pop culture too. But there's for some reason there's a you know there's got to be a psychology of conventions, and I don't understand right. it. Yeah, I don't uh, either. But, but. I, I mean, on one hand, I love the fact that the things I loved growing up that were niche are now loved by so many people, but mm -hmm. they're loved in a different way than I love them. Yeah. So when I go to the gatherings, I'm like, this is not what I'm here for. Like I, right. I want to, I want to dig through back issues. I want yeah. to meet, I want to, I want to genuinely meet and have a conversation with the creators I admire. I don't want to stand in line for four hours to have a 1.5 second inter interaction with right. dollars for an autograph. Like, uh, that's just not what I'm there for. If other people are into that, honestly, no snide, more power to you. But I, 
like I don't want to put up with the ridiculous crush of what some of these things have become to hopefully maybe have a neat moment once I get inside. Yeah. Now, here's what I'm looking for. And, and it's a perfect example of what I go to conventions for. I went to a convention here in Little Rock a few years ago. And I, I, I happened upon Neil Adams's booth while he was slow. And we said just talk for like an hour. Oh, wow. And that's what I'm after, which I right. think in the, in, the, in the conventions of old, before it became, you know, massively mainstream, I think maybe mm -hmm. those chances were a little bit more often. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas now it's, you know, you got to, you, I, I don't know. And I, I could be wrong. I've never been to SDCC and everything I hear about it. I'm like, I don't want to go. It's un, it's unreal. It's, it's, yeah. it's one of those things that I tell people you got to do once and then right. you're over, you're over you're it. Over. But um, it, it's, it's definitely like, you know, you're walking through and you'll be just shoulder to shoulder with people. And all of a sudden there'll be an actor, like a, you know, that all of a sudden the right. Avengers actors are right in the middle of the floor and everybody stops and you can't get to where you're going. Right. And it's like you just stop caring. And sort of yeah. Like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. Um, no, that doesn't sound fun. I mean, and for other people, it's fun for them, though. I mean, there are people that live for going to the um, to the uh, I forget what they call them, where it's like, hey, we're having a session about this TV show and there's going to yeah, be a panels preview. and everything. The panels. Yeah. There's people that live for that and, you know, oh, they camp yeah. out for a day and more power to them, but that's not what I'm there for. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it just, it like a, another thing, like uh, I'm also into gaming, like role-playing games and like that, there's no way I would go to the big ones because like Dragon Con, oh, it's, yeah. it's just turned into a huge thing. And, and, and I'm like, I want to get, like, I go to much smaller conventions. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm and, kind of that way now, like the biggest yeah. convention I do is probably New York because it's it's such a big I mean it's a big money maker. Um, but I enjoy smaller shows at this point. Like right. I would I I love anything I can drive to within like four hours or so. That's two right. or three days. <laughs> right. And um and then I go home and 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 two even if I if it's not a super lucrative show I mean I'm at home all the time. Right. And uh, my friend Chris um he he usually tags along with me helps me and so it's just. It, it, it's fun for me just to get out and right. get out of the house and then make a little money if I can and talk to people. And I do enjoy like meeting up with people that, especially since I've been doing YouTube a lot, um, I'll, I'll meet up with people that watch me there or I've interacted with on different things. And um, it, it helps remind me that there are actual people on the other side of the screen. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I want, I want the, like I, you know, I do, I've done my show in one form or another since 2015. I've done some YouTube stuff. Um, and I, I, that, when you meet somebody that has watched or listened to your content and generally connects with it and just wants to, that's a, that's a nice feeling. Yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather, uh, sit down and talk for somebody like that for an hour than a hundred people who were like, Oh, you're on YouTube. Okay. That's kind of cool. Whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And they just kind of rush through quickly. I just, right. it's just not my thing. Even if they're all paying 10 bucks each, you know, or something, right. whatever. Not that I would, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I, I don't go to conventions and charge money for people to talk to me. That's not what I'm talking about. Cause yeah. I, I'm not one, I'm not anywhere near that level of, uh, people aren't going to pay to talk right. to me. I guess is what I'm saying. So I'm talking to how hypothetically, um, but I knew that, like, I suspected, I was like, STCC, this just seems like it's really not what it used to be. And then uh, the guy from Mile High Comics, oh, Chuck yeah. Rosinski, mm -hmm. uh, he pulled out a few years ago. He's yeah. like, they don't even treat me respectfully anymore. Like, I helped start this convention, yeah. and they don't even treat me respectfully anymore. I'm out of here. And I, that just confirmed what I, you know, I was like, well, the, the focus has shifted. Because yeah, there's more definitely. money, yeah. More, there's more money in the in the movie stuff. So, yep. um, but anyway, which, and I enjoy the movies. I'm not, I'm not down on the movies. I enjoy yeah. the comic book movies. I enjoy. But it just depends movies. on your expectations. Yeah. If your expectation right. is to go to a big media event, pop culture right. event, you'll love it. Right. Right. If it's comics and you want to get maybe meet up with creators. Hit or miss, right? right. Um, well, I want to. I want to go to a concentration of my people, right? Yeah. My tribe, right? And 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 our tribe, 
or my tribe has been edged out of some of that stuff. Right. Yeah. Let's, that's just the normal process of things, but other conventions will take those places. Yeah. So, um, like I, you know, um, I'm sure, you know, Tim Lim and Mark Pellegrini. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're local. Okay. And so I run into them all the time and you know, that's what I'm looking for. Like I want to yeah. pop in and be like, Hey Tim, Hey Mark, what's going on? And yeah. I've had them both on the show you know, multiple times, love those guys. And I'm so glad at the success they're getting. So, mm -hmm. although I'm dude, I'm a black hops dude. I'm not, I'm not down on common America. I like common oh. America, <laughs> but I'm all about black hops. I love black yeah. hops so much. I'm always teasing them about, I want more rigor tortoise. I don't know if you've read any of that stuff. I have. I mean, I've, I've seen yeah. it, but I haven't read it. It's a great, it's basically GI Joe as animals, mm -hmm. but played straight. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, they don't poke fun at it. They play it straight and it's, it's good. So I like it a lot. I think that they're both very good talents and I'm glad mm -hmm. for them that they're oh, doing yeah. well. Yeah. They're out there. They're out there like you, they're working it hard. So speaking of working hard, um, what I, I know you're doing gunship thunder punch, mm -hmm. uh, you're doing William the last, what else are you doing right now? If, if anything, like, how do you, as a, as an artist, comic artist, creator, how, what are you doing right now? So, uh, in addition to those things, I mean, like I said, I'm on YouTube, I'm trying to you know, build up that audience or maintain what I've got or whatever. Um, I'm doing some GI Joe transformers art for a role-playing game, um, deck building type game. Here oh, what's it? Are you, can you talk about the name of that yet? Uh, it's from, yeah, some of it is out. It's from Renegade Games. Um, it's, uh, like a, I don't know all in and out not being a, a, a big of a gamer, but um, I know there's a lot of cards involved and then there's like, you know, the manual and stuff. So yeah, I'm looking right uh, now. Yeah. Um, some people I've, I've heard people say that it's good and they enjoyed it. So uh, Transformers some deck building game. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm looking at it right now. Oh, what um, is, this? is your art? This um, I looked the other day. I don't think, I don't know that my art is on the website yet, um, but uh, it, sh it shouldn't be too long. Well, they're um, showing a box of, it's got like Optimus Prime. Yeah. That, and then that's, Wheeljack um, is behind him. They keep showing like only a handful of images and there's a ton. They're just not putting them up on the site. So I'm, I'm waiting for people to start like posting, posting it themselves. Okay. Um, so this is, a, this is not your art. Then. No, no, that was okay. not me on there. Okay. There's, it's um, really super overcolored. Isn't the right thing, but there's so much color sometimes I like, mm -hmm. and it's a smaller image. So I'm having a hard time. Yeah. It it's out. hard yeah. to tell. From, from yeah. Me. Um, but now that I'm looking at the, at the, at the, the arms and forearms, I can tell it's not you. Um, cause you have that nice rounded, yeah. uh, yeah. G1 look. So you're doing that. What else you got going on? Uh, let's see. Um, I am doing, um, I'm doing some, some NFT stuff here and there. Just dipping my toe in and seeing what that's all about. But now, are, uh, are you trying to launch your own or are you doing? Uh, a few I have launched my, before? I have launched my own. Um, it's a series of robots, um, right. but uh, it's, it's just very, it's such a learning curve and I'm being very kind of cautious. Now, Is it, is it digital ocean? What is the open sea? Open sea. Is that what yeah. you're using? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and that, that's another thing you people have very strong opinions. <laughs> They have super strong opinions, which I'm not going to get into. No, no, uh, it's like I get I, it, but right. um, I've I've honestly had to like on Twitter. I I just have a different account for all that stuff because it's right. a completely different audience. Yeah, I I mean, I, one of these days I may do a show on it to just try to go over the the facts on both sides. Uh, yeah, you know, but I'm not. You know, NFTs is a is a creative endeavor that it's a business, just like most creative endeavors. And it's a technological platform, and that's all I'm going to say about it right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, send me a link to that, and I'll okay. You know, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and then I've got um, uh, you know commissions here and there, and uh, that I'm kind of backed up on those. And and uh, then I, the other day I was like, because sometimes I will draw uh, some art tip things on uh, YouTube, and I'll then I'll post them on Twitter, or whatever. And it occurred to me that. If I build up enough of these, I could do like a little art tip book. Yeah. So I'll probably do that in the next year or so, but that'd be like a little small side project. You do a lot of stuff on social media <clears throat> where you doodle faces. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there was one you did recently. It was really neat. You were you were people watching in a con. And you, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Uh, you were just drawing your people watching. But you did another one that was interesting to me because I've actually been doing. I don't consider myself a major artist by any means, but I've been doing Inktober for like oh, a little yeah. over three years now, and I've seen. I'm like, hey, I'm actually starting to do something here. This is, you know, uh, there's been two things that's interesting for me about doing Inktober. One, I'm like, oh, I've got more art chops than I thought, you know, because I'm exercising that muscle. I, I've got a friend named, uh, I don't know, Jeff Nodelman. Uh, he d- he's done a lot of animation. He was, he was the Noodle Soup was the studio that did the first three seasons of Venture Brothers and stuff. Oh, okay. Like that. But he, he's a one. He's done a lot of. I call him the Forrest Gump of animation because. Everything he stumbled into was like a really high profile thing. Like Disney <laughs> right. and Batman, the animated series. Yeah, I know stuff. those type of guys. Yeah. <laughs> he's a wonderful guy, though. But he's like, yeah, it's a muscle. Just keep working it. Yeah. And there's been two things. That, one, I've seen my stuff improve to where like where I'm like, I think that's pretty good. I like I like I, I can't believe I drew that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is like I'm seeing a style emerge. I'm yeah. like, I, I wouldn't have chosen that style, but that's the style. Yeah, that's the way it goes. That, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> so you posted something that was very interesting where you posted a bunch of faces and you showed how they were all basically triangles. Yeah. 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 So that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you did a book like that, I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's the kind of thing that I'd like to. You know, yeah. Uh, and it's part of that whole thing of, of you know, you're, you're, you're just on YouTube and you're, you're doing two things at once, right? You're maintaining, connecting with your audience. Right. Right. And then, Oh, well, I'm drawing these things that don't seem to really fit. Like, Oh, I'm not really getting work done. And then you realize, no, wait, I need, I can use this for a different project, you know? Right. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of, that happens quite a bit. Like you doodle something or you draw something and then you set it aside. And then a little while later, you're like, Oh, that could actually be a project, a real, a real right. thing. So, um, I'm I'm trying to. You're constantly having to tell yourself, no, it's okay to do <laughs> do that stuff, right. even though you're not getting paid directly for it. Right. Yeah, because it all it go it all goes into building up your whole yeah, yeah your whole thing. So you're doing that. Uh, anything else? Anything else you got in the hopper? I'm sure there is, but my brain is full now. <laughs> okay. Do you have any tips for aspiring? You know, because you, you're still like in the world of uh, like, I would still, I would say like, if you're a professional artist or professional comic book writer, like you touched earlier, like it helps a lot to go to cons because mm-hmm. you're still going to get, you know, might end up at the bar talking with your editor mm-hmm. or something like that. And still, even today in the social media, digital world, meeting people face to face is powerful. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and if an editor or somebody needs something for a project, if you know them personally, yes, uh, you might get the job, even though somebody else has an equal or better level of experience and skill, because that person's more comfortable with you. They know how to get a hold of you. They know, right. you know, they know they can trust you or they like you. Um, like I've, I'm starting to do some RPG, tabletop RPG writing. And, you know, going, there's a con I go to uh, every year in North Texas um, called North Texas RPG Con. And I don't go for the networking on a mercenary level, mm-hmm. but it certainly has been powerful to get to know people, right. you know, yeah. And, and, yeah. and to, yeah, who do what you want to do. Surround yourself who do the stuff you're wanting to do. Like when you were at that studio, man, that was so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you have any other tips beyond like, go to cons and meet people. <laughs> do, do you have any tips? Um, other than just, you know, keep making your stuff. Um, the, the, one of the biggest things now that I'm, I'm discovering, I actually wrote a blog post on this. I, I'll, I'll update my blog pretty regularly. Um, is that, you know, you're trying to promote things and get your work out there. And it, you, you think, Oh, if I just I stick with it, I do all the right things. My audience will come. And I, that's, not necessarily true. You can do all the right things and still not yeah, have if you, it happen. If you build it, they will not necessarily. Come. Yeah, because right. there's, yep. you know, you're dealing with algorithms and a whole bunch of new factors in the last right. like five years. Right. Um, so don't don't take like if you put something out there, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, whatever, and it gets very few views. Don't be don't think don't think that as a rejection of your work. Right. Um, because, and we, artists tend to do that, right? Oh, nobody saw this. Almost sucks. Like, well, no, they're just not seeing it. Right. Right. They're, it's not breaking through the background noise. Right. right. So other than, than just get used to making things and putting them up and just sticking with it. Um, 
that that's super important because you never know when you're going to get a little crack in the in the wall right, right? um but too you know, if you're a creator you should be doing that anyway um, so do you think that um i used to hear stories that people were getting seen on Dev deviant art and contacted mm -hmm. do you do you still think that deviant art is a good place to put stuff I, I don't, I haven't been on there in a very long time. And I okay. think a lot of people have just moved away from that to Instagram and Twitter. Okay. Um, but I, I think now Instagram and Twitter um, are are shifting just because it's, especially Instagram has gotten really frustrating because people aren't seeing things anymore. And uh, I saw um, a pretty, pretty high profile, high profile creator with a you know, hundred some thousand uh, followers on there to get people to go to his mailing list because he can't reach them on instagram anymore well and that is you know i i read a lot of articles on marketing self-promotion quote and quote unquote there's like this side ho side hustle culture kind of thing yeah. um and i don't mean that bad i mean it's just what they call it a side hustle it just means stuff you're putting energy into to make money outside of your main gig um and and i'm seeing more and more recommendations to to build up that good old traditional email list. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm seeing that come up more and more often. So, and I would still say as much as we were kind of like, ah, the big cons aren't really for comic book people anymore. Okay. So let me, let me be careful to navigate this, especially for somebody who wants to get into the industry. There are a tremendous metric booty ton of cons all across the country that are not SDCC. Right. And even SDCC, you might have a chance to rub shoulders with somebody that would be a good networking opportunity. But like I see, like I'm going to use this for an example because they're an example that's in front of me a lot. Mark Pellegrini and Tim Lynn go to a lot of quote unquote small cons and they get out there with a really positive attitude and they'll sit in that booth all day long and talk with people. And that that is a way to get your stuff out there. And yeah. also I know for a fact that I know too many artists and creators that, oh, my booth was next to so and so's and we got to talking. And then they introduced me to so and so. Yeah. You know, and and so that I think there's still a lot of value. I guess let me try to put it a better way. One of my things that I say a lot is one thing rarely completely replaces another. Mm -hmm. We still have newspapers. We yeah. still have radio. We still have TV. Now we have websites. Now we have social media. It, one thing rarely completely replaces another. It just further segments how people get their stuff. Yeah. yeah. So don't just say, well, I'm just going to do Twitter. You right. know, yeah. do as much as you can with your resources and time without going broke or driving yourself. Broke. Right. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Well, Brian, I'm going to wrap us up just out of respect for your time. We, okay. we're, we're about an hour and a half now. So I know you've got William the last and his new arch nemesis, Billy the first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you, so you do think there will be a third volume of gunship thunder punch? Yeah. Yeah. There'll be another, okay. uh, this, this story is uh, basically kind of a trilogy. So, okay. Anything else that you have cooking that you want to make sure people know about? Um, other, you know, I would recommend just going to my website. I'm trying to point people there from there. You can get everything I do and I control that space. So, yeah, it's funny. Things are shifting back to websites yeah. Yeah. because people are trying to get, to get out of the algorithm. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, so I, a lot of people are doing discord servers too. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, a, yeah. So what is, what is your personal website? Uh, Brian dash shearer.com. Okay. And anything you want to send me, like that blog post, okay, uh, yeah. you know, uh, your YouTube channel link, any of that stuff, I'll put it in the show notes. Folks, you know, remember, you can go to shaneplays.com. There'll be a post for this episode, and these links will all be in there. So, uh, well, Brian, I, I really appreciate your time. I yeah. love, I should have spent more time gushing about this. I love your art, dude. Okay. Now, I have not seen a lot of your G.I. Joe or whatever. But your Transformers art is spot on. It's oh, so good. And you also do cool stuff like uh, I loved your Optimus Prime Batman mashup. Oh, oh the, <laughs> yeah. That was such a perfect mashup. So um, I thought that was really cool. So uh, well, thanks. But yeah. So, you, do, you know, but people follow. Follow Brian. He's a, he's a great artist. Uh, 
you know, and he's got a pretty impressive back catalog out there working on some high profile properties. If you want to check them out. Um, and, and, and I have to do this to you, Brian. I always do the, it's, I don't do a podcast every week anymore. Mm-hmm. I, when my radio, when I have the live FM talk radio show is weekly. Now that I podcast it, it goes out, you know, a couple of times a month, but I still call it the bad joke of the week. So it's uh-huh. just mis it's just misnamed. So I've got to do it to you. Every guest gets to enjoy in quotes this moment. Okay. So Brian, what do you get when you mix a transformer with a cow? Um, Oh man. I feel like I, I feel like I should be able to figure this out. <laughs> um, transformer in a cow. Now you're not I allowed don't... to milk it. You got to give me an answer. Okay. Uh, let... I'm just joking. Let me think here. A Moogatron. <laughs> no, but I got to give you points for, for that. No, it's Optimus Prime Rib. Oh, man. <laughs> we're close, kind of. <laughs> so it's supposed to be bad. So if yeah, you felt yeah, that's a good. horrible. If you felt a horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. Yeah, a little, a little moment the, of despair. Crept yeah, up that there. was that was the appropriate <laughs> uh, appropriate response. So well, anyway, folks, again, it's Brian Shearer. Fantastic artist, sometimes writer on his properties, creator, uh, and and he's so good he will actually ink while his wife is in labor. So, <laughs> or are you more? I didn't even ask. Do you do more pencil work or more ink work these days? I mean, obviously on your your self properties. Yeah. You're doing, uh, well, at this yeah. point, I'm I'm pretty much doing pencils and inks and well everything usually except for that transformer, uh, the role playing game stuff. They got a different colorist, but yeah. So are you coloring your own stuff too? Uh, usually, yeah, if I can. Okay. Coloring is so important. I, I like to say on the show that colorists don't get enough respect. Yeah. It's very critical to the end product of what a comic book, and the letterer too. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it's all, you know, the artist and the writer always gets all the credit usually, but the colorist is so important, um, vastly important. So all you got to do is go look at the same page, black and white and color and you know you can see the difference there. Yeah. So, yeah. what is your favorite thing to do? Pencil. Um, color? It it just depends. I really enjoy the the coloring phase of my own stuff, but I don't enjoy coloring other people's things. Okay, fair enough. Um, and I would love to see that X Men. If you dig up that X Men, yeah, I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would. I would love to see that. So, oh yeah, I was going to ask you. So, are you still like traditional? pencils and inks or, or have you moved over to computer or tablet or like what are you what are you oh, yeah i mean with? i uh, I, uh, I still do both a little bit but mostly uh the traditional stuff is commissions and then just sketching um but for my own stuff especially i've pretty much moved to like the tablet um because okay. it's just so much easier and faster so is that, are we talking like wacom or, or yeah like, it's a, it's, the... i've had a wacom i've got an xp pen basically the same thing right now right. in so, clip studio so yeah well, that's cool uh, I do, um, when I do my drawings, I usually do roughly one a week since it's October. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a little bit behind right now. I just go in with ink and that's it. Yeah. And if I, if I mess up, I just, I don't do pencils. I just yeah. do ink. And then, uh, and that I was telling you, Jeff Nodelman was like, I'd go crazy if I did yeah. that. But I'm like, well, that's just how I didn't know any different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, when I sketch, usually I just go straight to ink. I, I don't, yeah. I don't, yeah. You know. Well, I, I probably would improve if I would go to pencils and then inking, but it's like, you know how it is once you develop a habit, yeah. it's really yeah. hard to break that habit and go back. So, but it, on the other hand, it takes me a really long time because I'm like, oh, I got to make sure not to mess up. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, Brian, it's been a pleasure. Uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Maybe one of these days I'll get to bump into you. Yeah. Hope so. um, hope so. If you run into Zippy, the unicorn yeah. or uh Duncan Naples, tell him I said hi. I will do. And uh, I will we will catch you um hopefully in a future show. All right, so, sounds good. Everybody else, we will see you next time on Shame Plays Geek Talk. Thanks so much for listening to Shame Plays Geek Talk. I certainly hope you enjoyed this journey into the things we love. For your convenience, show notes with helpful links for each episode can always be found at shameplays.com. You can catch the podcast in several places, including on the blog at shameplays.com, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, Verbal, YouTube, and more. Shame Plays is also carried on sci-fi.radio. Sci-fi.radio is sci-fi for your Wi-Fi. S-C-I-F-I dot radio 
If you like what you hear and would like to support Shame Plays Geek Talk, you can do so for as little as $1 per episode on Patreon at patreon.com slash shameplays. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Stay geeky, my friends. <laughs>